Good evening, welcome to the Java Users Group for March 2017 in Louisville, Kentucky. My name is Devin Phillips and tonight we will be talking about multi-threaded and concurrent programming in Java. So stop and think about it, when we were younger and we started working with computers and, and what we were doing, we were using single processors that had single processing cores and so concurrent programming was basically stop your program, switch to a different process, do some processing there, stop your program, switch to a different process, do some processing there, so on and so forth. There was really no such thing as concurrent programming unless you were in the high performance computing or scientific computing world where you were building clusters. Um, and distributed applications were quite rare. They were very limited to academia and research. Um, and as, as these processors got faster, we wanted to try and get more use out of them. So the, the single programs that we ran back in the days of DOS or old school Unix, they couldn't really tie up uh, a CPU full time. So they started implementing multitasking operating systems like Multics, like Unix, like Windows and Mac OS and BSDs and things like that so that they could do what's called time slice multitasking which is exactly what we were saying. Take a program, run it for a few ticks, switch to a different process, run it for a few ticks, switch to a different process, run it for a few ticks, so on and so forth, so that you could run multiple applications and use up that CPU time more efficiently. But nowadays, we've got these, you know, even my laptop is a quad-core, quad-thread, so 18 processing, or eight processing cores per se, uh, and 16 gigabytes of RAM and so it's very possible that you could have multiple threads running trying to access and use the exact same resources at the exact same time and so the the concept of writing multi-threaded multi-processing code has become significantly more difficult uh, and with the scale of what a lot of people are doing over the internet these days distributed systems have become more and more common. Uh, we all need to now run five, six, seven instances of services in Amazon or across multiple distributed availability regions in different cloud providers and different data centers. This makes all of this concurrent programming significantly more complex. So let's talk a little bit about the background of multi-processing, multi-threading. And when we talk about being able to run multiple jobs at the same time on a CPU, we're really talking about three possibilities. And those three possibilities are processes. And a process is a single isolated application that doesn't share memory outside of itself. We're talking about threads threads exist within a single process and can share memory with one another. And then we're talking about fibers. And fibers are basically an abstraction on top of threads that are even more lightweight. So instead of spinning up multiple new threads, we spin up a pool of threads and we run tasks through that pool of threads. Much faster than trying to spawn new threads, which takes more resources. The other aspect that fibers gives us is fibers can actually uh, allow you to have better control of how your tasks are scheduled without having to have too much context switching, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But the real takeaway in this slide is that in terms of overhead, processes take more resources than threads, threads take more resources than fibers, and that's processing and memory resources as well as memory bandwidth resources. Uh, and I want to iterate, if anybody here has any questions about anything I talk about, feel free to interrupt me, raise your hand, or, or ask a question. I, I don't hold on any kind of ceremony here. All right, so multitasking. Humans and computers are not very good at it. Androids might be a different story, but um, when we're talking about multitasking in computers, where there are limited ways that we can readily tell an OS to schedule processes. 
So in Linux, for example, the default way of multitasking is to do time slices, like we were just discussing. Uh, processes and threads are given control of the CPU and execute until a timer interrupt. Uh, and then the CPU switches out the current context, which is the, the cache and the, uh, the main memory pointers and the stack, and switches in a new process and gets it all started. And it keeps doing this over and over and over again, sharing resources across multiple processes or threads. Um, the problem is, is that these timers that switch us between one process to another rarely ever align with what our processes are trying to do. So if we have a thread that calculates uh, some Fibonacci numbers, for example, a simple example, um, it might finish before that timer interrupt. And so it would send an interrupt to the, the CPU, to the kernel, to say, hey, I'm done already. And now the CPU has to try and switch tasks again when it wasn't ready for it. Uh, that can be expensive. And then there's the other side of that equation is that we've got a long running process. Maybe we're trying to generate uh, 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 cryptographic keys. That can take quite a while. And maybe uh, it takes longer than a time slice on a single CPU. And now you get halfway through, you've got to make a checkpoint in your uh, calculation. You've got to pause it, switch back and forth, continue, so on and so forth. That is also expensive. So. A good way to think about this, and I tried to come up with a good analogy, is you're, you're working on an expense report, right? And your boss comes along and says, okay, stop that and work on this. How long does it take you to switch tasks? You know, you're working on your expense report, you've got a, a stack of receipts, a, a spreadsheet, and uh, maybe your phone's out looking at your Uber expenses and, and airline reservations, things like that, and you're putting this all together. Now you've got a Put all of that away and make sure it's in the right order so you don't count the same expense twice and <coughs> put that in a file folder. Then you've got to get out this other work that you want to work on. Maybe it's a completely different spread, uh, set of spreadsheets or a time report or something like that. That overhead of switching between one task and another is what we call context switching um, in the computer science world. And so if you have to do that on a regular basis, if your, do if your boss is coming by your desk every 30 minutes telling you to change tasks, how much time are you losing to context switching? How much resources are you losing to context switching? Possibly quite a bit, right? Yeah? Everybody agree with that assessment? Um, whereas if your boss just hands you a stack of things that need to get done before Friday, then you can logically organize that work in such a way that you can work on it most efficiently. Uh, that's leading toward the concept of fibers and being able to do very lightweight processes. How many of you have ever seen a diagram like this of, of CPU memory architecture? Yeah? Yeah? Okay, so you've got a, a processor core and, and this is obviously a dual core system. Uh, and this is an Intel architecture diagram, but we'll talk a little bit about some others. Uh, and in Intel architecture, you would have an L1 cache that it consists of an instruction cache and a data cache. You have an L2 cache that is per core. And then you have an L3 cache that may be shared across multiple cores. And then you've got a memory controller that connects you to main memory. So thinking about that, from L1 cache to the processor core, back and forth to the stack and the registers, super fast. That's the fastest memory access you can get. Between the L2 and L1 cache, still pretty fast. It's still on the CPU die. It's still in the same chip, very fast. L3 to L2 cache, still pretty fast, not quite as fast as the other two. But the problem comes in is that between main memory and the L3 cache, that is actually relatively slow and has limited bandwidth. So the more cores you have, the more hyper threads you have, the more stressed that limited resource becomes. And let's look at this in terms of, of different architectures. Let me see if I can get that uh, little thing in the bottom to disappear. But 
if we're talking about an Intel Xeon processor, uh, an x86-64 Xeon processor, it has 32K of L1 instruction cache, has 32K of L1 data cache, has 256K of L2 cache, 30 megabytes of L3 cache, one memory controller, and can achieve about 60 gigabytes per second throughput to main memory. That's kind of limited. Um, and if you're trying to switch contexts quite a bit where you have to move data back and forth between the caches and main memory, then you can saturate that pretty quickly, especially if you're processing a lot of, of streaming data. But Intel isn't the only architecture out there, right? There are other architectures out there, like let's say IBM's Power 8 architecture. And you can see here, Power 8 doesn't have two separate L1 caches. It just has one that shared both data and instruction. But it's about the same size. You know, it's 64K for both. It has double the L2 cache. It has almost or more than triple the L3 cache. But check out that last statistics there. Does that blow your mind? It's more than quadruple the memory bandwidth. That's amazing. So that means that context switching is less expensive on a power rate system. Uh, and you also notice it has two memory controllers. That's also pretty impressive. Um, so that kind of changes things how you think about it. When you work on uh, a multi-processing system, you've got to take into account the architecture. And every time a new Intel or new AMD or new IBM power or cell processor comes out, these statistics change a little bit. Now, these, these numbers that I have here are for uh, about two years ago, I think. Uh, I think this is Haswell for the Xeon and uh, Cell 5 for the Power 8 architecture. So um, these aren't the latest numbers, and they change from CPU to CPU. Like uh, the new KB Lake Xeon processors probably have close to 96 meg of L3 cache. They still only have a single memory controller, though. That's just part of the Intel architecture. Uh, so something else to keep in mind is shared memory state. When two threads potentially executing on different cores have to manipulate the same memory, it either has to be located in the L3 cache or they have to go and do manipulation on main memory. Uh, that's either one, the, the, the possibility of being in the L3 cache is low, and then manipulating directly with main memory is an expensive, relatively expensive process. Uh, now when I say relatively expensive, I mean relative to accessing L1, L2, L3 cache, whereas relative to disk access, it's really fast. So we've talked a little bit about context switching. Oh, great. My slides have stuck. Apparently. What's going on there? Oh, man. That's really annoying. There we go. Hold on. We're in the wrong place. Let's see if we can get this to go. I love it when things go wrong. <laughs> All right. So we've talked to in very general terms so far a little bit about context switching. So, and we were talking a little bit that uh, context switching is when the CPU has to save the current state of what's running, store it off to main memory or to a disk uh, swap space, load up a different process in its state and then begin executing again. So process one is running, uh, it gets an interrupt, uh, we have to do save state, we have to load state, 
and then we can start running again. And then we hit an interrupt or a system call. Uh, we have to save state, reload state, and start running again. Every time we're doing that context switching, the CPU is basically wasting time. It's doing the work of what it takes to do the process switch or the context switching, but it's not doing useful work for us. Um, so the the CPU sits idle a lot while single processes are waiting for things like user input or I/O operations or new work to be added to the processing queue. This is why operating systems went to multitasking in the first place, was so that they could, you know, start up a new thread that could do work in the background while it was waiting on other things. Uh, and this context switching is pretty good, and it's designed to optimize the downtime of the CPU. But it has limitations. The CPU and its firmware and its capabilities don't truly understand your programs. They do try to do things like cache prefetching, where they guess what data you're going to need, and it tries to keep it loaded in those near-line caches, L1, L2, L3. But without truly understanding your program, it's just making a really general guess. It's a heuristic. It's a very simple algorithm that it uses. And so depending on how well you write your program, it may or may not be getting the data where you need it. And I, I kind of liked this uh, Game of Thrones picture because of the just changing faces over and over. I think that worked out well for context switching. So in Java, the, the way we accomplish multi process or being able to run multiple tasks at the same time is using threads. Java in and of itself really isn't capable of multi-processing. That's it is capable of spawning other processes but it's not capable of coordinating multiple processes within the JVM. Um, and using things like shared memory or shared memory mapping and things like that between multiple processes. So what Java does is it uses threads, specifically uh, what are called green threads, which are reusable threads. And, and the Software, the, the APIs that provide this are the thread and runnable types uh, and the executors and executor service types. And we'll kind of discuss those a little bit more detail as we go. A thread is an interface that anybody writing a program can implement and it will allow it to be executed as a thread. Uh, the more specific interface, runnable, is designed to be used in a task style API where you can submit multiple runnables to a queue to be executed by a task scheduler. Uh, those have been around and, and common since very early days of Java. Since Java 1.5, they've added this new feature called executors. And executors are a way of doing what's called thread pooling. We talked a little earlier that threads have a certain amount of overhead to get a new thread created. Um, so if you create a new thread for everything you want to run in the background, that has a certain cost associated just in overhead to start that thread. What the executors give you is what a concept known as a thread pool. So you create a certain number of threads that you just reuse over and over and over. That way you don't have to constantly spawn new threads, you just reuse ones that are already existing. It reduces the amount of overhead that you have to go through. Uh, executors, the executors type is a factory class for creating pools, schedulers, and thread factories, and something called callables. Callables are another type of, of continuation, which is a generic term for processes, threads, and fibers. Uh, when the executor's factory is used to create a thread pool or a scheduler, it returns these as type executor service or scheduled executor service, and there's some other more specific types under that tree. And it's misbehaving again, isn't it? Wonderful. Apparently not very well, anyway. Come on. 
It's that animation. It's killing it. again. So simple threading in Java is accomplished by presenter screen. There we go. Simple threading in Java, as we discussed, is, is done by ex implementing the thread or the runnable interface in Java. Uh, that's the simplest method of implementing threads on the JVM, though when I say simplest, I mean it's, it's the lowest level code with the least overhead and and, and the simplest API. But there are newer, more complex APIs that make it easier on you as a programmer, that are easier for you to work with than writing your own implementations of thread or runnable. Threads are started or submitted, and at which point they become a separate continuation to be scheduled by the kernel. Uh, since they are threads, they have access to the shared memory of the JVM, which means that a thread running on core 1 can share memory with core 3 or core 2 or core 4, however many cores are within your system. Uh, and that, that is both heap memory, on heap memory, and off heap memory. Uh, and I'm not going to go too deep. Does everybody here at least a little bit understand the difference between on heap and off heap memory in Java? Raise your hands if you don't know what on heap, off heap means. Okay. So in the Java virtual machine, there are two types of memory that the Java virtual machine conceptualizes. There's memory that the JVM manages for purposes of garbage collection and understanding its usage and being able to control its usage, and that's called the heap. And the JVM has very strict type controls of what can go in the heap. It has to be known types. Uh, it has to be fairly well defined. Uh, it has to be able to be garbage collected by the JVM. And then there's off heap memory, which is basically kind of like memory you would use in C, where you allocate memory as you see fit, use it however you want, uh, and the JVM doesn't manage that memory. It's never <laughs> garbage collected. You have to, you know, allocate and free that memory manually. Um, by default, threads are created in one of two ways, either, either as a daemon thread, everybody familiar with D-A-E-M-O-N spelling, uh, or a non-daemon thread. And in terms of the JVM, a non-daemon thread will continue ex executing even if you reach the end of execution of the main program. A daemon thread, on the other hand, if the main program reaches the end of execution and is ready to exit, it will cause the daemon threads to exit as well. So if you want to have threads running, but when you reach the end of your program, you want those daemon threads to be able to be exited, that's what you use daemon threads for. Uh, Non-daemon threads will keep your program running regardless. And this is all based on a concept known as a thread monitor. By default, your initial thread, like your main method, it holds the thread monitor for the entire application. But by using certain programming techniques, you can have threads that are nested and assign their monitor to just their parent thread or to the top level thread. Depends on how you write your code. And it hung again. I think it's got to be my recording software at this point. Does not like it. 
jumped way ahead. So, as we were talking earlier, since Java 5, there's this new concept of thread pools. Whenever we create a new thread that has a certain amount of overhead, it takes memory, it takes CPU, it takes more heap space, uh, and it can be inefficient. But what if we create, what also happens if we create more threads than we have processor cores? That means that we now have threads that are waiting on other threads, right, to, to go through their time slice. Um, and that can create even more context switching, which can add more overhead. And by creating those as thread pools instead, we can limit the number of currently executing threads to maybe the number of cores we have or number of cores minus one so that we leave one core available for coordination. Um, and this can actually help us reduce context switching. The idiomatic way of creating thread pools in Java is to use executors and the executor service. There are fixed thread pools, there are cached thread pools. Uh, since Java 7, there's the new fork join pool, which is sort of a default thread pool. And that fork join pool was improved and implemented with the streams API in Java 8. And we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. If my slides will advance. <laughs> I just can't win tonight, can I? I love technology. Um, so here are some of the uh, method signatures for the executors class. Uh, as you can see here, we've got new fixed thread pool where we specify a size, new cached thread pool. Uh, so a fixed thread pool is exactly what it sounds like. It creates a fixed number of threads in a pool, and we can then submit jobs to that thread pool. A cached thread pool can be more efficient than a fixed thread pool. So a cached thread pool just says, okay, create a thread pool. I'm going to submit jobs to it. And it's going to spin up as many threads as it needs to to handle those jobs. And let's say you only submit a job, you know, two or three jobs every few seconds. Uh, it may only spin up one or two threads and just keep reusing, using, keep reusing those one or two threads. Uh, especially if some of those threads are waiting on I.O., like they need to do disk reads or they need to do something across the network, they can be paused and waiting in the background. So maybe we spin up more threads than we have cores in a cached thread pool because many of those threads are blocked and waiting. And so we can have lots more threads running without taking on too much context switching. Uh, a scheduled thread pool is a special case of a fixed thread pool where you can submit a job to run after a delay or at a specific time. And then a single thread executor is a simple pool containing a single thread to which we can submit jobs. And that can actually be quite useful for certain things. It, it comes down to using a concept called processor affinity, and we'll discuss that a little bit later. So the fork join pool. This is new since Java 7, improved in Java 8, and we talked a little bit about the CPU, the kernel, the OS, don't really know what your code does, right? So they can only make very uninformed guesses about how to schedule your processes and how to keep the the nearline cache is filled with the appropriate data. Well, the fork join pool tries to improve that situation by managing its own threads. And so because this is part of the Java virtual machine and it runs through the just-in-time compiler, through the Java profiler, it can make better guesses about which threads can be switched at which times to get the most efficiency. Uh, by default, the, the JVM runs with a default thread or fork join pool that is equal to the number of cores minus one. So if you have a machine like mine that has a, a quad core with hyper threading, it would have seven threads in the fork join pool. Uh, and because it better understands your code, because it's part of the JVM, it can make better guesses about what to put in your nearline cache. It can make better guesses about when to switch threads. And it can do things like 
uh, what's called pipelining of instructions. So it could move all work that's similar and uses the same pool of data to a single thread that stays executing on one of those cores permanently without any context switching because it's smart enough and it knows enough about your program to make those sorts of decisions. Uh, there are libraries out there that can go even further. Uh, one example is called Quasar. Uh, Quasar is an implementation of fibers on the JVM. Uh, but it requires some programmer overhead. You have to put more knowledge into it to make it work better. Uh, the fork join, uh, fork join pool implements what's called the divide and conquer algorithm to implement work stealing. So let's say you have five different processes that you normally run. One's doing factorials, one's doing Fibonacci sequences or something, one's doing uh, generating key pairs, whatnot. And you've got a, a constant stream of jobs coming in. That divide and conquer algorithm will assign the appropriate jobs to the appropriate threads to keep them running as constant as possible without context switching on the available cores. If there are enough cores available and there's not too many threads running. And even when there are more threads and processes running than there are cores available, it will still try to optimize those workflows so that you can get the maximum efficiency. Questions about that? I know that's a, a kind of interesting concept and it can get quite deep there. Also new in Java 8 is this idea of streams. Has everybody heard of Java 8 streams yet? Okay, Java 8 streams are a, a new API, if my slide will ever come up, that allow us to take collections of objects and do operations on them as a stream of data. And inside of the Java 8 Streams API is this method called Parallel, where you can take a, a job stream, where you take a list of objects and do manipulations on it. You can throw that Parallel method at the beginning of that, and it will automatically spread it out into a fork join pool without you writing any additional code. Autom automatically your process of processing of that list becomes multi-threaded and the JVM handles managing those threads and then correlating the data back to a single solution in your original calling thread. That's very powerful. Uh, when I first started writing Java that was you know an extra two or three hundred lines of code to implement that kind of threading. Now it's like an extra two or three characters really to do it in Java 8 streams. Um, and it allocates one thread per CPU core by default. Uh, you may or may not want to use the default thread pool though because if some of those stream processes are being blocked by I.O. or blocked by network or waiting for user input, you might want to spin up even more threads. And so there is an option to change out which fork join, uh, you can use a different fork join pool than the default if you so choose. But that comes down to you knowing how your program works, what sort of user data comes in, what sort of work it's doing. Concurrency. It sounds simple, but then you're worried about things like race conditions and concurrent modification. How many of you have heard the term race condition? Yes? Who can define what a race condition is for me, or at least give me an example? No? Nobody? Jeez, come on, we've got an architect and a Java teacher here. I don't want to read it. <laughs> and nobody can answer this. So what a race condition is, is let's say you have two processes or two threads running, and they both want to modify the same spot in memory. Let's say, for example, you're keeping count of the number of web requests coming into your application. Um, the normal algorithm at a very low level is go read this memory location, you find a number there, you pull it back, you increment that number, and you write back that incremented number to that memory location. Now imagine you have two threads trying to do that same thing. 
they both go and read that memory location and pull it back. So that maybe they've both got the number two that they've pulled out of main memory. They both increment it to three. And they both go to write it back. Is it correct that we had two different web processes execute, but we've only incremented by one? No. No, that's a race condition. Um, and a concurrent modification is, let's say we have two different web processes that are writing information to your bank account statement, right? You have a debit come in from one uh, Amazon purchase and your wife was buying something on Pinterest at the same time and they both debit at the exact same moment, but for some reason only one of the debits uh, gets registered properly. That's a concurrent modification. Now obviously banks have systems to handle this, right? We hope most of the time they get it right. <laughs> yeah, they want, they want to stay in business. So, uh, or, or worst case scenario, you know, say they're doing the direct deposits and you know, your wife's direct deposit and your direct deposit both come in at midnight at the same time and oh wait, only one of them got credited? That's no good. You know, that would be awful as well. Um, that's a concurrent modification and so we have to watch for that sort of thing. Uh, so how do we solve these problems in Java? Well, we've got a lot of tools in our toolkit. Dang it. And because my slides are taking so long, my timing sucks. <laughs> no, no, no. That, it's just a lot of tools in my toolkit. I wanted that picture to show up. <laughs> So in Java, we have a couple of different tools that we can use to try and prevent race conditions and concurrent modifications. Um, you have the synchronized keyword, which we'll go into detail about in a couple of slides. And you have the new Java Util Concurrent libraries that have come about since Java 5. Uh, Java Util Concurrent, Java Util Concurrent Atomic, and Java Util Concurrent Locks. Uh, Java Util Concurrent has a bunch of lock-free uh, collections, data types that we can use. So there's a, a, a new type of map in there called concurrent hash map that you can use on as many threads as you want and it will prevent you from accidentally changing uh, a particular key at the same time or it provides you tools to prevent that. Uh, there's new methods on that map called compute if absent or put if absent and it's an atomic operation. So if you try to write that deposit at the same time to the same key in that map, it won't happen because if you're using put if absent, only one of them will successfully execute. Uh, the Java Util Concurrent Atomic package has these really cool classes that are all about lock-free single variables. So there's a thing called an atomic integer that has an increment method that when we were talking about our, our web application counting the number of hits, you could just hit that increment method on that atomic integer and it will guarantee always that it's incremented properly and that you don't end up with a race condition. And then finally, the Java Util Concurrent Locks package contains interfaces and classes providing a framework for locking. And locking is a special topic and we'll talk a little more detail in some of the coming slides. But it's actually a way for us to say, while I'm modifying this, don't let any other threads try to modify this. That's what locks are all about. Um, one of the most common examples of a lock that people talk about uh, in programming in general is either a semaphore or a mutex. Uh, and in Java, they're actually one and the same. You use the semaphore class to implement one or both or either. So race condition. <coughs> And, and I like this animation for a race condition, too, because what happens here? Huh? What, what happens to Charlie Brown? He goes running after the ball. He's going to kick it, but before he can get there, Lucy pulls the ball away, and he falls flat on the ground. That's a race condition. Lucy pulled the wool out, or pulled the rug out from under him. That's what a race condition is all about. Uh, the textbook definition of a race condition is an undesirable situation that occurs when a device or system attempts to perform two or more operations at the same time, 
But because of the nature of the device or system, the operations have to be done in the right sequence. So let's discuss a situation like this, right? We set up a map that relates time in minutes to number of page views, like we were talking earlier. We have a map that has one key for each minute of the day, for example. Um, and for each minute, you know, we, we add on to that map we increment the number that's contained at that key until we get to the next minute. We increment that number and, uh, so that we know how many hits our website took for every minute of every day. Useful, right? And a lot of people need those kind of analytics for their websites. But as we said before, if two threads try to grab, increment, and write back <coughs> that value, we may or may not get a correct answer because they modified the same data at the same time. Uh, probably the simplest way to solve this in modern Java is to use those Java Util concurrent data types, uh, concurrent hash map, linked, uh, concurrent link queue, DQ, things like that. Um, those are actually very powerful data types and we'll talk about them when we go to our example code here in a few minutes. Come on, slides. Now I understand why people use an external machine to do the recording. Yeah. I've got to get myself a little HDMI capture card, I guess. So locks. A lock is a mechanism by which we tell our program that it needs to get exclusive access to some sort of resource, whether that's a file or a piece of memory or uh, a network socket, you name it. We want to make sure that only one thread or process is manipulating that resource at any given time. Uh, this can involve some sort of blocking mechanism where you say, okay, this thread has grabbed this lock, and when somebody else tries to grab that lock, they get blocked. In other words, they wait until the first thread has released the lock, and then they'll get their lock and continue processing. Um, but this can lead to a bad condition. Let's say this thread grabs our lock and then crashes. Now this thread comes to grab that lock, but the lock is still in effect. That condition is known as a deadlock. It means this guy can never get access to the lock for the resource he wants to manipulate. Now it doesn't necessarily have to be a crash, but that's a good example. Um, and a deadlock can be very difficult to debug, but thankfully in recent versions of Java they've given us some really new nice tools and we'll talk about those and demonstrate those when we get to our example code. Another way that we can synchronize or, or manage concurrent data access or concurrent resource access is using the synchronized keyword in Java. You can use the synchronized keyword as a method modifier so when you're writing, you know, public void, calculate, blah, 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 you can put synchronized at the front of that. And by just putting that synchronized keyword at the front of that method, that means it can only ever be run by one thread at a time, that method. That's really simple and very powerful, right? Uh, unfortunately, if your method is too long or too complicated or it has some kind of blocking operation in it, it could tie up that thread for a while and prevent anybody else from accessing it. So we might want something a little more granular. And that's where the synchronized code block comes in. So instead of setting a whole method as synchronized, we can just put synchronized and an object and say a small little code block is synchronized. And that gives us a lot more fine-grained control. And one of the newest features, this came about in Java 8, is the completable future. And completable futures are, believe it or not, this is stolen from the JavaScript world, honestly, uh, which stole it from some other functional languages, which actually stole it from a technique invented in assembly in C. So this is actually old becomes new but they've actually created a really nice, simple to use API around this. So if you look here, what we've got is a completable future that we give a method to, to say, hey, execute this method, and when it's done, 
then execute this other method and supply the result of the first method as a parameter. And when that's done, the result of that method parameter to the next to the next, you can chain those together like that. And they're completely asynchronous. So this block of code will execute that quickly and you'll move on. But in the background, all of that work will happen on separate threads as they complete each uh, link in the chain. And when it's done, the then notify calls a callback method that handles the final result. You can also use completable future dot any of or all of. So you can take a completable future and submit n number of tasks with any of. As soon as one completes, it will resolve the completable future. With all of, as soon as they all complete, it will resolve the completable future. And in addition to that, you can set it up so that when those resolve, you can say succeeded or failed. So if all of them complete but one of them failed, you can have a different action than if all of them completed successfully. And so then you can also coordinate. So if we submitted a bunch of tasks using a completable future, um, we could then say completable future dot join and our main thread will block and wait for our computable, completable future to resolve. So that's a way we can spawn off a bunch of parallel processes to get a bunch of work done. And when it all is finished, then we can resolve in our local thread and send back a response or, or write to disk or do whatever, whatever it is we needed to do with that result. Does that make sense to everybody? Um, in the JavaScript world, Mm -hmm. So it's a serial, one after another. One of those. So there's many options with completable future. The first example that you see up here, when we see uh, completable future dot supply async, then apply, then apply, then apply, then exceptionally, then notify, this would execute serially. Okay. These two, the any of or all of, executes in parallel. Uh, and in the JavaScript world and a couple other languages like Scala or others, they call this a promise uh, because you're saying, do this work and give me a promise that you'll give me a result later. That's what this is all about. Questions about that? Is that a pretty cool concept though? I mean, that's really powerful way to, to compose processes and threads together very easily. And again, this uses the, the fork join pool that we talked about earlier so that it doesn't just spin up a bunch of threads, use and waste a bunch of resources, cause too much extra context switching. And last but not least in the slide, here's my takeaways, if the slide will come up. Take this chance to have a drink. And this is, honestly, the takeaways I have from most things that I try to teach people is keep it as simple as possible. The simpler the code is, the simpler the logic is, the easier it is to debug. Don't try to add complexity until you find a bottleneck or you find a problem that you need to solve beyond what the simple case handles. Profile it and benchmark it. You know, Try writing it using parallel threads. Try writing it using completable future. Try writing it using fork join pool. Uh, and see which ones run faster or see which one you know, makes best use of the resources you have. Uh, the Java micro, harness, or micro benchmark harness, JMH, that was introduced in Java 7 makes this super easy to do. It's only a few lines of code to do a test spike where you can try this stuff out and see how many times you can execute this in X number of seconds. Um, it's really, really powerful to help you profile and understand what's going to give you the best performance. And you always want to try to target this on the hardware you're actually going to deploy on. So if you're deploying to AWS instances, make sure you run your benchmarks on AWS instances that are similar to what your production code is going to run on. Uh, don't run it on your laptop, get your profiling information and say, oh, okay, I'm going to run it on this Quad Xeon machine now and expect it to work exactly the same, because it won't. As we talked about, different CPUs have different memory architectures, different caching options, 
different numbers of memory controllers and memory bandwidth. It can make a huge difference. Understand your needs. The better you understand how your program operates, the better you can organize your code to reduce the overhead from context switching to possibly even, for some cases, eliminate context switching by using processor affinity. Use the tools that are provided to you. Uh, how many of you have ever used Java Visual VM, J Visual VM? Comes with the Java Virtual Machine. It's on your machine, I can almost guarantee it. So if you run the command J Visual VM, it fires up this graphical interface that has memory and CPU profilers, it has thread analysis, it has object allocation analysis, memory utilization analysis. This is a super powerful tool. You should totally use it on a regular basis um, to look at your code and see how well it's functioning. But even better, nowadays, those deadlocks we talked about, nine times out of ten, if you've got a deadlock in your code, you fire up JVisual VM, there's this red bar across the top that says, deadlock detected in thread blah and instruction blah. And it tells you exactly in your code where that deadlock occurred. It's really great. Now, there are certain cases that it will not detect for deadlocks, specifically latch-based locking mechanisms. And we'll talk about that in our examples here in a little while. So this is after the monthly the Yes, absolutely. And then finally, I cannot emphasize this enough because I see it way, way too often. Do not reinvent the wheel. If there is already a tool that does this, probably especially if it's something that's in the Java standard APIs. There have been hundreds of people that are probably smarter than most of us that have really vetted, tested, and debugged this thing. Use the tools that they provide you. Don't reinvent the wheel. That also goes for a lot of open source projects like Google's Guava or Juice or Spring Framework or Akka or Play or Vertex. They have a lot of really smart people working on that code. And if you find an actual problem, which is entirely possible, go and help them fix it in their code. That way, everybody benefits. That is the end of my slides. So what we're going to do next is we're actually going to start looking at some code, which means I can now hopefully Get rid of this stupid. Uh, yeah, you're not going to uh, cooperate with me, are you, Google Slides? Hey, come on, close, close, close. Wow, I did not realize that this uh, video recording software would take up so much resources. It's really dogging down my machine pretty bad. Can't even close Chrome. No, a, a container wouldn't change the fact that it's trying to use a bunch of CPU. But what you could do in a container is you could set limits on the memory and CPU utilization. But I could actually do that using uLimits or process nice in Linux anyway. Um, not really, no. Uh, containers are really good to have a standard deployment across multiple platforms and architectures, or frameworks, not architectures, multiple platforms and frameworks. So like if you need to be able to deploy Python applications with multiple different versions of Python or multiple, multiple different versions of core libraries or something like that, containers make a really good use case there. With Java, containers, if you're just doing Java, containers really don't make a whole lot of sense because the JVM in and of itself is a container. It's already very isolated. And you can already set a lot of those same process and, and memory and CPU limitations on the JVM itself. So Docker really doesn't gain you much in a purely Java environment. 
most of the time when you play for Java, you're either going to be doing a fat jar, a war, or an ear file, and it's it's already self-contained. It's got all of its libraries baked in. There's no conflicts or anything like that. I find it kind of difficult to approach. I've played around with it. I've attended a couple of sessions on it, and I really... It's less useful to me than Parallel Streams as far as grokking and understanding and reasoning about it. Um, that said, I know a lot of people swear by it, and, and there are certain features that I can appreciate, like back pressure. Being able to implement back pressure is very important in a high throughput environment. But let's try and kind of stay away from that topic because that's pretty deep, getting into back pressure and trying to explain that. All right. You know, guys, uh, I think I'm just going to pause the uh, video recording. <laughs>